more than five of you here, so that makes this a success already. So let's hope this goes well. Um, this is my co-presenter, uh, Gordon West. <laughs> um, I've been in Seoul for about three, over three, almost three and a half years teaching ESL. I started out at a Hagwon in southern Seoul near Seoul National University, and now I'm at a private elementary school teaching science for third and fourth grade. Um, Gordon and I taught together at the Hagwon. I'm still at the Hagwon. <laughs> She's moved on. Um, but he's, he's moving on next week, so. So same boat. Um, this is Learn by Doing, critically engaged TBLT, task-based language teaching, uh, for elementary and middle school students. All right, so this is just an overview of what we're going to be doing today. Uh, first, we just want to tell you why we use TBLT and why we think you should. Um, also, we're going to talk about selecting topics for your learners compared to selecting tasks. Then we're going to move into a task cycle. It's kind of a flow, building things from smaller tasks up to larger projects. Connecting and sharing, probably the most important part for me. So it makes it a more meaningful experience for your learners. It makes it a lot more fun, which makes it more fun for you. And then troubleshooting problems we've had, problems that you could probably foresee in your own experiences, or things that you've had already. All right. So what is it? Task-based language teaching. What does it do? First, tasks are usually a job that needs to be done. Some kind of a communica communicative, probably saying that word wrong, goal social interaction, it emphasizes communication through social means. So it makes it more realistic for your learners. It's not just robotic, automatic responses. It's when they actually get to practice things more relaxed, <coughs> more realistic. They're not afraid to make the mistakes because they're with their peers. And they're actually using the applied skills. It also reinforces the previously learned concepts. So of course, prior knowledge, both language-wise content-based, it pulls upon the previous lessons, combines things together so everything is so segmented, it's much more well-rounded, and you can see how everything's connected. They can actually start to build personal meaning for all of these lessons, put them together. And then the last part kind of ties into the other two. It helps make them more fluent. They're actually using things. That's the big thing using them in a social setting, not memorizing, well they are not memorizing the words, they're not memorizing the phrases, they're using them and applying them towards a, a goal and an activity, something where they can actually see the impact of their language. So, <clears throat> I like using TBLT with my classes because of the motivation that the students have when we do it. It's just been my experience that in classes where we have tasks that are goal-oriented, then the classes become more student-centered, and they become a lot more active in the process. And because they're having to communicate with each other and communicate to do something, it feels like they want to do it more. Uh, especially when we talk about doing critically engaged TBLT. So when we do that, we try to find problems that the students might be having um, and then work to communicate to solve those problems. And that's really motivating for them usually. Not always. It doesn't always work to motivate students. So it's not the case that I will use TBLT in every single setting, every single class. But for a lot of my classes, this has worked really well. So, how do we make it critically engaged? It has to be some type of a topic that's real world, but it also has to be something that's interesting to your learners. Not to you necessarily, but to them. So, what we want to do is we'd like to exercise with Think, Pair, Share. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with it. But I'd like you to individually take a few moments to think of topics you think would be interesting to your particular learners. 
And then I'd like you to pair with someone near you and discuss the age group of your learners and some of the topics that you think might be interesting to them, share your ideas, and then we'll join together and get a couple different ideas from all the different teachers and instructors and students in the room. So, a couple moments by yourself, please.
but uh, in my elementary school classes, the top answers were always friends, family, personal artifacts, like their pencil case, or like, it's amazing, their yo-yo, Pokemon cards, like that's huge. And sports, of course. And then in middle school, my students talked about politics, school policies. School policies were a really big one, in fact. Um, but these can, like, they said they wanted to talk about them, but they weren't ready right away. Like, they weren't comfortable enough. They didn't trust me enough to talk about this stuff right away. So we started with the other stuff they wanted, like K-pop and sports. Uh, and we work our way into the more important stuff. So. Uh, We've got some ideas of some topics that might be appealing to your learners. Now it's time to pick the task. The T in the TPLT. Um, but first, uh, we wanted to just talk a bit about the difference between a task and an activity. But linguists and educational professionals, all these different groups have yet to come up with a mutual agreement of the difference between a task and an activity. So we just wanted to share what we consider to be the difference. So a task, we believe, has a goal, some kind of a social goal with a lot of interaction and engagement. It's the applied use of a language skill or a grammatical rule, not necessarily learning it, but an applied use of it. And then um, it's also very student driven. This is not structured by the teacher. The students have power in making the choices on how they're going to achieve that particular social goal. An activity, on the other hand, would be something that is just general practice, work that needs to be done. That's going to be structured by the teacher, led by the teacher, overseen by the teacher, and it's used by the teacher to assess how the students are getting along with the rule or with the, with the skill. So that's what we believe. Any, any other ideas? Sound good? Good job with that one then. Test okay. just sounds better than So who here has done task-based teaching before? Has anybody done it before? How did it go? Yeah, pretty well. Pretty good. Yeah. Would no. you mind sharing what, what, what it was that you did? Um, I can't really think, really think of a specific example, mm -hmm. but um, just for example, just giving them a little bit more freedom to express themselves and not really focusing too much on like, error correction the moment I hear mm -hmm. you know, just letting it flow. And correct, yeah, at the end, correct, yeah, correct it, or I agree, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you want to make Sure. Um, a, a couple of you raised your hands, and I'm sure the rest of you are interested, otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So, we'd like to get into groups again, three or four, to combine those pairs, and discuss some of the tasks that you have put into your lessons, uh, which were successful, which were not, and maybe you give each other some ideas for some tasks. A couple minutes to do that. If, if you haven't done the official task based teaching before, just think of uh, I guess what you would have considered activities or classroom projects that you've done.
after they answer that, it's just a small Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
they can talk about what friends that or what the, what animals their friends are like and stuff like that. So we can kind of blend the topics to match their interests. So, yeah. Any more tasks uh, that you want to share? Some that were really great. Some that were really bad. No. I'll show a really bad one. All right. <laughs> uh, now this, uh, as I said generally tasks, they fail when you don't plan thoroughly step by step. You just focus on like, the final goal of your task. You don't think about the first step, second step, third step. You plan thoroughly then, then your task will just probably fail. Yeah. That's kind of what we're going to do mm -hmm. um, So, Dave and Jane Willis, this is a book that I use a lot that's been really helpful. Um, they talk about, they classify tasks by like cognitive skill, what you're doing in the task. So like even really low level learners, like uh, that example of the animal lesson, like animals can and can't do, that's pretty basic stuff. That's with some of my like real beginners. And so we start with tasks that have like a really low cognitive difficulty in their listing. First they list the animals that they see, or they list the animals that they can think of. And then they move up to more difficult tasks, like comparing the animals. So, and then, if you do this the right way, it creates tasks that kind of fit into the next task. Uh, kind of like you are talking about the different steps of your lesson, kind of that you fall into place like that. Uh, some of the examples that uh, they gave just three of them were listing, so like listing all the animals, uh, sorting them by, you can sort them by which animals you like or don't like, and then ranking them um, which animals are the best, or which animals are strongest, which animal is the fastest, I think. And then the whole time kind of doing group work, so they have to talk to each other and not just you, so the groups get together and talk about their ranking, and then they have a goal to come up with a list of the top five animals, and they have to have that list, and everybody's got to agree. Not everybody's going to agree. Or the key is to pick things that not everybody's going to agree on, so it generates discussion. Sure. How, how do you keep them from just talking to each other and then down? That's, that's one of the big things. Uh, it happens a lot. But uh, you try to limit it by monitoring them, moving around, and usually when I'm in close proximity, they'll speak in English. When I move away, I can tell them they move back in the cringe. <laughs> but I feel that as long as they are working on it, somebody has to report. At the end of the process, somebody's got to report. And I keep track of who the reporters are, so at some point in that process, somebody has to communicate what happened in English. And at least when I'm there, they're doing it, I feel like it's, it's generating communication with the class. So, I mean, it's better than just standing there and talking to them and nobody speaking English. So. I've also noticed, again, the practice thing. Is, uh, the more and more that the students are asked to do this, the more comfortable they are doing it. So. Even if they're speaking in Korean, I'll start to notice more and more of the English words pop in. No, blah, 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 something in English. Blah, 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 something in English. Which is much better for me than Korean, 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 Korean. So as long as it's slowly getting the mix, I'd much rather have that than solely Korean. Or dead silence. I, I'm in a special situation where I'm still at a hog one, so I have small enough classes that I can control them fairly effectively. I know it's a bigger problem with public school classes. So. Um, and I'm a science teacher, so a lot of the topics that I have my students talking about, a lot of vocabulary I've introduced is very advanced, it's complex, so they're not always sure how to communicate their opinions on things either. So I, I'm going for just there. Whatever I can get from them is usually better than I'm expecting. So we, we're going to have to practice this. Um, 
kind of go through this three, three tasks you tried before, but I think not everybody has tried a lot of tasks. Um, so I think we'll kind of skip through this. Right. This is on your lesson plan template that we handed out, the one with the, <coughs> the template, pretty easy to identify. <laughs> this is just a suggestion of how to make a lesson. It also has all the ideas for the task flow cycle. Reminded of them. They're listed in order recommended by Willis and Willis, but of course, according to your particular topics and the needs of your students, they can choose. Yeah, and so these kind of these are just a few ideas of kind of kinds of tasks that you can do in your class. So like these first couple, like these work with even like elementary level learners. So real beginners who have never come into English before, they can start by listing the Conglish words that sound English. And then they, by the end of that list, they can see, wow, I know a lot of different words <coughs> in English already. So you can do some of these tasks with, uh, with even old level. And the, the thing is to just make sure that they are, they can do it alone, but then always do like think they're shared, talking to each other, generate communication. Um, and these are all things also that we kind of do in basic everyday conversation. So when we're talking to people, we are comparing stories, we're <coughs> listing events of what happened that day, ordering things, matching with other people, uh, sharing personal experiences a lot, um, working on projects and creative tests, and especially problem solving. Um, something to walk away with at the end of the day that you can use on well it's Mondays and holidays so Tuesday morning you walk into class you have something so you don't have to spend Monday night worrying. Um, so take a few minutes uh, think of maybe an upcoming topic that you have uh, an upcoming lesson that you have and then think of just kind of some of the things that you could do I mean maybe you have a review you've got to do and then think of some of the tasks that you can do with this topic, like uh, listing, sorting, matching, that kind of thing. I'll give you a few minutes to think. starting to share so everybody you want to kind of share talk together with uh, the people next to you or around you
discussion classes usually with no real grammar, but I know a lot of Korean teachers always have uh, the grammar stuff. <laughs> so there's usually grammar objectives that you've got to cover. Uh, the official TBLT way of doing it is to do all those tasks and then 
the thought is that your students will feel where they are inadequate to meeting those goals of communicating. And then you give them the grammar or the vocabulary that they need. Um, and sometimes this works well, but I don't always follow this. Um, I sometimes give them the vocabulary or the grammar that they need before the task. It just depends on your students, what they need. It's, it's all about you getting to know them and what they need. That I don't think it always has to come after and then they have the realization, oh, if I use can jump instead of he's jumping well, then they understand better. You don't need to do that. Um, always. Sometimes it works really well. Connect and share. This is the most important part for me. So now that you've had them do all these small tasks, you've been talking about this big project, how are you going to make it real for them? Somehow we have to connect to the real world, make it meaningful and personal. Um, I think we, we're just going to skip this and kind of show you how we do it. So this is some of the things that work very well for us. All right. So. Uh, in my kindergarten, this would work for <coughs> low-level elementary school, too. I found this website. Uh, we have a list of resources here we'll give you at the end. Uh, of all these artist-based projects, and I found this one where they were living on, uh, this group of artists moved onto a frozen lake and built, uh, like, art shanties, they call them. Frozen, uh, like houses on the frozen lake for a month, and all these artists just built a community out there. So I got my kindergarten art class to write them a letter. They called out questions to me. I wrote the questions down to say handwriting is very good. Um, and then they drew their pictures and wrote little notes on their pictures. We sent it off, and we got a letter back. And you can see they listed every single question we asked and gave a super detailed answer. This was a four-page letter, and the kids got this, and they sat down. They would not let me tell them. There's no teacher, no teacher was reading, and they just read as hard as they could, and they found, like, this question, do we live in the North Pole? No. And when the kids understood that, they loved it. They laughed so hard. They called all their friends over. As soon as they understood something, they're like, oh, wow, come here, come here. They're like, North Pole, no. No, so really motivating for them to try to understand what was uh, what was being said to them. Uh, second grade, so this is part of the critically engaged stuff. Uh, we have a market day at our school, and the prices kind of inflate every year. And my second grade class was really angry about this. So in one class, they made protest posters, and we went on a march uh, around the classrooms, and those posters got taken away and destroyed so fast by my director. <laughs> I couldn't even get a picture. It was like we were out on our march and boom, 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 poster is gone. Um, so they wrote a letter then to the director. They all sat down and wrote a letter. Um, and it just happened to be perfect timing because we were talking about uh, complaints was our topic. So. This is moving up to fourth grade. Um, we were science class talking about health. So I thought it would be more interesting if I asked them to ask people in their lives about health. So they got together in their groups and they made survey questions, surveys asking their family and friends and schoolmates and teachers what they thought health was. Is it the same for everybody? Who says so? And I asked them to put together their answers from the survey, the survey results, into a puzzle to fit it all together and show me what a picture of health would look like. And so these are the puzzles that they came up with. I didn't tell them anything about the design. I didn't tell them anything about the survey. This is what they came up with, and it just it floored me. They have different kinds of health, mental, physical. They have the components, the ranking, the results of their surveys. And my Korean co-teacher said that when I left the classroom and it was his turn, they have a 10 minute break in between, they wanted nothing to do with him. They just wanted to keep working on their survey in English. In English, fixing the survey question, 
making sure they had the correct number of people they were going to talk to, delegating roles, designing, making small perfections, and it was all in English. They didn't want anything to do with the Korean grammar part that was coming next. They were just totally into the project. Made my day when I heard that. This is also fourth grade, different school. Uh, we were learning about endangered species. So I wanted to do a research project, but you, know, you do a research project, you give a presentation, it's pretty run of the mill. It's good, it's effective, but I thought it would make a much more powerful impact, much more critically engaged type of a project. <coughs> we made a video and we actually published it for the world. So if you're curious, you can go on YouTube right now and type in this title here. There should be three different videos on YouTube open to the public to show my class's research on endangered species. So they all research um, in groups of three or four on endangered species. And they picked what they wanted to say, and I recorded them. They drew these pictures, and we put it together into a really cute video. Um, so I'll kind of just touch on this for a minute because this gets into our troubleshooting. I heard uh, some talk about how we break tasks down, like bigger projects. Like if you do a uh, public elementary school or a class where you only see them once a week, how do you keep things going? So I did debate uh, with my class, my middle school classes, and debate is a huge project. The problem is, at the high one even, we have kids that leave for a few weeks, take a few weeks off, come back. And so with this kind of lesson, I had to break things down into stages that could be finished in one less, like one class period, that they could take something away from it, and then slowly build up into the debate. Um, so first of all, the debate itself was uh, spontaneous debate. The first speeches were written and then everything else the students had to take notes and respond with speeches on the fly, which is pretty high level uh, difficult stuff. But uh, the way that I broke it down was that way students who came could just drop right into class on the last day and do the debate. Um, and the things that we did were cover all the skills that they needed to be able to do that. So example, uh, note taking. First of all, I had them list like, what what uh, can they do when they take notes? Uh, what do they do now in classes to take notes? And we watched a video, and then they listed some things in the video, like using different colored pens helps. Uh, next, they we covered some of the language that they might need. So they wrote down like shorthand. They made their own shorthand. We talked about how to write in shorthand so they can write things quickly. And we talk about strategies for listening. So they list the strategies for listening, and all this time we move through these tasks of listening, and then we sort what are good strategies, what are bad strategies, talking. Uh, we compare what do people do, what do other people not do. Um, and this kind of structures the discussion in class, is, is the best way to put it, I guess. And then by the end of that week, we've covered all of these different skills for note taking. Um, and so they feel confident, hopefully, taking notes and they practice everything. So that kind of breaks it down into like one week we cover notes, the next week we cover questioning, how to ask questions to each other in the day. So breaking it down. Um, that leads us into troubleshooting. I think we just have a few minutes if anybody wants to. I just, um, my biggest problem with it is just timing. I usually have, uh, we were talking about that over here, I usually have a great project, a great task that I can see. It's going to be so wonderful, and I don't have enough time to do it, or at least enough time to do it correctly. So my biggest challenge is making sure that I do use that task flow, or at least select things from it, and take, take more time to do a large project. I really want it to be as low stress as possible for my students so they enjoy it and they are actively engaged in creating it and working together. So if I can break it down into smaller tasks, they feel more comfortable with it, they're doing it correctly, and it just makes the final project so much better. So just if, you, if you're able to, spread the projects out into a much smaller time frame. And um, that would be my number one piece of 
advice. That was my biggest problem. Do you have um, any questions? Thank you. <laughs>